Let's talk about the suburbs. Walkability, urban planning, the toll it takes on us and our society. This is a topic I have been wanting to cover for so long now, so I hope you guys are down to deep dive with me because honestly, it is so fascinating. Not to mention, it is crazy to realize how the problems of the suburbs and urban planning affect so many aspects of our lives. From the economy, to the environment, to mental health, to even the overconsumption trends we often cover on this channel. There's a good chance you've already recognized some of the problems with suburbia, whether it's that nagging feeling in the back of your mind because you grew up in the suburbs and something always felt off, or you've just absorbed the frustrations and feelings of other people talking about it, which would not be surprising. Suburbia has been the muse of many angsty songs and elicits quite strong quotes from people like, quote, have you ever lived in the suburbs? It's sterile, it's nothing it's wasting your life. Or quote, the suburbs are incredibly oppressive. I actually believe that the suburbs are much more dangerous than the ghettos. Like I said, quite strong quotes, and not ones that I completely agree with either, to be frank, but it's still telling, isn't it? That more and more of us are having frustration around sprawling lawns, white picket fences, and McMansions galore. That so many of us are craving community and walkable towns and affordable homes. So why is that, and are they connected? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about the problems with suburbia, how they affect our minds and our money, and most importantly, how do we fix this? Two caveats before I start though. One is that I will be talking about the US suburbs because that is where I was born and raised and that's what I'm most familiar with. Not to say that it won't apply to suburbs outside of the US, but just know that there might be some differences. And then number two, I'm not an expert at urban planning. I love learning about it and I think I've put together some great information in this video, but also this is a far cry from some masterclass critique of the suburbs. So instead, I hope you guys see it as an invitation to a much larger conversation, one that can be continued in the comments of this video, in your own time, reading resources and checking out other videos, and maybe even other videos of mine that I can make in the future because I'm really passionate about this topic. I hope you guys like this video and are interested Interested, and if so, I'll definitely make more. Speaking of which, if you're new here, hi, I'm Kara, and I make videos on the intersection of money, media, and intentional living. I love exploring how money and media live at the intersection of so many aspects of our lives, and I also hope that you come out of these videos either learning something new or thinking about something in a new way. And if you like this video, you might like my other video essays like Let's Talk About Water Bottle Culture or Why Toxic Productivity Culture Doesn't Work. And all right, one final tangent before before I get into the meat and potatoes of this video, and I know what you're thinking, Kara, why do you do these long intros and these tangents and you're gonna kill your attention, you'll probably throw an ad read in there, what are you doing? Well, random internet person with a very funny voice, you're probably right, but this is a very important one for me to say. We're talking about the criticisms of suburbia today and for good reason. Like I'll get into, our suburbs have problems. In many ways, they are stagnating us as a society and as people, and I want desperately to see things change. But, and a big but here, I want to be clear that I like the suburbs. There are a lot of positive things about them. People create good, happy homes and lives in the suburbs. And contrary to what some hardcore suburb haters out there might say, I don't think we should get rid Rid of the suburbs. There's a quote I love that goes, it is easier to destroy than to build. And I hope that message comes through not in just this video, but in all of my videos. Because it is really easy, not just easy, but enticing to look at something, be it the suburbs or an economic system, a social network, a whole society, and say, oh, it's broken. Therefore, let's just scrap it entirely, destroy it, get rid of it. To say the suburbs suck, we messed up, America's a failed project, or whatever else you can think of. Because Criticism alone does not take much effort at all. What is hard though, and what is so important is the ability to build, to take something that is less than perfect and tackle the complex problem of how to make it better. I say this on my little soapbox because despair and pessimism, they feel so good to indulge in, and you might be tempted to indulge in them as we talk about the problems of the suburbs. But just remember, Pessimism does not breed progress. There are real ways that we can help solve these problems, and I'll talk about those more towards the end of the video. But what's important is that we stay optimistic and motivated to help solve these problems, or we're not gonna be helping anybody. Pessimism is not how we are going to make the suburbs, or anything for that matter, better. 
Okay, so now that everybody has clicked off this video, let's start with a quote about one of the biggest problems with the suburbs. American cities were not built for the car. They were bulldozed for the car. That is right, my friends, car dependency. This quote was said by the amazing YouTube channel, Not Just Bikes, in his video called The Dumbest Excuse for Bad Cities. Highly recommend, by the way, I'll link it down below. And what I mean by car dependency is that much of the US is designed with cars in mind first, not humans. This was not always the case though. The US used to have an extensive tram system in our cities, also known as streetcars or trolleys. Thousands and thousands of miles of these were laid out by the early 20th century, and they allowed people to easily move around the city in addition to walking. And for longer routes, we were huge fans of the rail system. But nowadays, we have this. Sprawling suburbs and cities where you're essentially trapped if you can't drive. I live in a suburban area where we technically offer public transportation, and to go downtown, I would drive about 20 minutes. But if I use public transportation to go downtown, I literally Google mapped it and it would take two hours. That is ridiculous, that is bad design. And look, I'm not saying public transport needs to always be on par with a car. There are some destinations in the suburbs where maybe a car makes more sense, like when you go do a big old Costco run. But the public transport options should at least be somewhat competitive, no? They should at least be viable for people who want to use them. I lived for a bit in the London suburbs and going downtown was much faster, not to mention cheaper, via public transport versus a car. Now sure, that's London, but a lot of other suburbs in cities have at least a viable public transport option to go back and forth. AKA, there are ways to get in and out without a car. Washington DC and its suburbs, Munich, Germany and its suburbs, Sydney, Australia and its suburbs. But right now, most of our suburbs don't look like those cities and their suburbs. Instead, we're placed into these individual islands of life that can only be accessed by the giant talking lion turtle that is our car. When we grab food at Target, an island. We go in, get our stuff, and then we're out. And don't you dare loiter. Want to go to the park after that? Another island. Time to hop on the ancient turtle slash car. And okay, lovely island, but now we're stuck in this enclosure where we just can do laps on laps and laps. Until what's that? Oh, I'm hungry, so let's go to a restaurant. Time for yet another island adventure. And that becomes the cycle, island after island, but little to no connection in between, even if you tried. And people have tried, but sidewalks that stop abruptly and endless parking lots where you're dodging cars don't make for a very connective tissue of society. Thus, we are stuck on our ancient lion turtles, forever going from island to island. I'll be honest with you guys, I don't know why I committed so hard to that Avatar The Last Airbender metaphor, but we're here. Lackluster metaphors aside, this utter dependence on cars leads to a wave of problems we're familiar with. From obvious ones like environmental issues caused by having tons of cars on the road, each spitting out trails of exhaust. Even electric cars take a toll on the environment from their lithium batteries to just the fact that they also share the road. To less obvious problems like how human connection suffers in car dependent suburbia. Sure, we get privacy, but it's at the expense of community. Speaking of privacy, I do not want people being able to Google me, which is why I use today's sponsor, Delete Me. Oh yeah, I told you I was gonna have an ad read in here. But genuinely, I love Delete Me. I think their service is phenomenal. If you don't know already, Delete Me is a hands-free subscription service that will remove your personal information that's being sold online. Companies collect data about us all the time, from emails to former addresses to our age and phone numbers, and then that makes it easy for others to search and learn about you. Which personally, I don't want people knowing me that way. For example, I had Delete Delete me remove all my personal information and the process was super simple. So I gave the information to delete me and then their experts find and remove my personal data from tons of online data brokers. Plus, Delete Me continues scanning and deleting your personal data every three months, sending you a detailed report each time. For my most recent report, the experts reviewed nearly 6,000 listings and removed 25 listings where my personal data was exposed. If you're interested in getting your own detailed report and having your personal information stay private, you can use my discount code CARA for 20% off. That's code CARA, C-A-R-A, at joindeleteme.com slash CARA, which I'll link down below. Thank you so much to Delete Me for sponsoring today 
today's video. So there's this urban planning concept called spontaneous encounters that human connection thrives on. Basically, these are the random run-ins with friends while you're leaving work, the stumbling upon a local flea market or festival while you're out for a stroll, or striking up a conversation with a stranger next to you on the bus. These spontaneous encounters give us texture to life. They remind us that we aren't alone in our day-to-day. -day. We're sharing this space, this life, and this world with other people. When I think back to some of the most magical feeling moments of my life, they often involve spontaneous encounters, like coming across a street artist in Boston who drew me for a dollar while we chatted about our childhoods, a crowd of people in Madrid singing along as this man belted a song from his hotel balcony, or just one of the many times I'd run into friends on my college campus and we'd end up grabbing food together after. I actually think that's why so many people talk about college being the greatest time of your life, because I know for me at least, my mental health was not as good in college, and yet it was still this really special, joyous time because I was in a walkable community. I didn't depend on a car in order to be able to get food or connection. With the majority of Americans now living in the suburbs, and the suburbs being a place that is so car dependent, it's not a huge surprise to me that we're seeing an epidemic of loneliness. As I talk about in my video on aesthetic subcultures, I think we end up gravitating toward materialism and aesthetic obsession because we're in search for community. The same can be said about stan culture and how it fills the gap of connection we're missing in our physical lives, something I touch on in my video on stan culture. Thus, pouring money into clothes, accessories, cars, tech gadgets, all things that let you signal your part of a community are just an extension of the consequences that happen when we build a society that is too isolated because of car dependence. Now you might say, well, cars are a quintessential part of the suburbs. You can't have the suburbs without cars. And just to be clear, I'm not talking about getting rid of cars. I'm not saying people shouldn't have them and if they want them, that they shouldn't use them. While researching for this video, I learned that was actually a really popular talking point for conservative critics of more walkable cities and suburbs, a concept being packaged these days as the 15 minute city. More and more people are becoming aware of what these governments are doing around these 15 minute cities. It's seriously like you're turning every city into the Truman Show. I mean, that's like you, you try to go beyond, they're gonna like put up walls in each city now. And yeah, that's exactly Exactly well, I is. think that's what the fear is, is that they're like, you have everything you need right here. You can't leave here without some kind of carbon emissions permit. It's not fair to call people like us conspiracy conspiracy theorists. Watch this BBC explainer. Part of their argument is that the 15 minute city movement is taking away our individual rights to own cars. And that if you think about it, we already have 15 minute cities. I can already access groceries and schools and parks and doctors all within 15 minutes you know, as long as I use my car. But that argument ignores the issues that we just laid out, like the fact that car dependency leads to more pollution and social isolation, both of which are negative externalities for our country. Not to mention another issue in that some populations are more negatively affected by car dependency than others. Car dependence can be awful for lower income Americans, because if you can't afford a car in the suburbs or city you live in is car dependent, then how do you go to work? How do you get groceries? How do you be a successful member Member of society if you're essentially trapped. This is the halfway point of a two hour trip to work an eight hour shift, a four hour daily walk just to get a paycheck. According to Kelly Blue Book, the average cost of a used car in October 2023 was $26,500, while a new car could be bought for the average price of about $48,000. That is a lot of money. We set people and our economy up for failure when a wildly expensive product is needed to be economically productive not to mention be financially secure themselves. Even if you find a cheap used car for $5,000, that is still $5,000, plus you're probably gonna have to pay a lot of maintenance because it's a $5,000 car. Suburbia's car dependency isn't great for any of us. Even if you don't live in the suburbs, even if you personally love your car and would still use it daily in a 15 minute city, the effects of car dependency still impact each and every one of us on a macro scale, which is why it's important for us to talk talk about the problems of the suburbs and how we can collectively help to fix them. Speaking of which, what are the other problems of suburbia? Well, strap yourself in for two of the most boring words I could possibly utter, zoning and subsidies. I know, pretty tantalizing stuff, huh? But 
Seriously, it is really, really fascinating stuff once you get past how boring the words sound. Because those seemingly boring things, those are the root of where the really interesting problems come from. You know how so many of us feel like we can't afford to buy a house these days? How rent feels like it's skyrocketing? How something about European towns just feels so much better than American ones? So much of that stems from zoning and subsidies. So let me explain. Bad zoning is why a city like San Francisco looks less like this and more like this. Because San Francisco has a zoning problem that prevents the limited land out there to be used most efficiently. According to the San Francisco Examiner, quote, almost two thirds of San Francisco's residential land is zoned for single family housing and 38% of the city's land in all. Single family homes are the traditional epitome of suburban living. Back in the day, you had Levittowns where mass produced single family homes created the iconic imagery of the suburbs. And you even had Sears catalogs where you could mail order these kinds of standalone units. And don't get me wrong, the post-World War II move towards single-family homes provided lots of short-term gains, like increased access to and affordability of home ownership. However, it's also led us to today, where the 20th century zoning restrictions mean we have a strict limit on the supply of homes we can create in cities and suburbs. And as any good economist knows, when supply is low and demand is high, prices go up. It also worsens the car dependency that we talked about before, because when everyone is so spread out, it's really hard to implement good public transport. I mean, that's the problem with the rail network. If you only have single family homes, there's very few people who can utilize it. So people just end up driving. So what's the alternative? For that, let's take a look at Copenhagen, Denmark. Urban planning nerds love Copenhagen because it is famously well-designed. And I know Copenhagen is a city and we're talking about the suburbs, but there's a lot we can learn from Copenhagen about how to improve suburbia. From their pedestrian infrastructure, to the enclosed biking lanes, to the use of renewable energy. There are tons of ways we can improve suburban development. But I want to specifically hone in on the zoning issues we were talking about before. See, Copenhagen allows for mixed use spaces. Take the street of Strogo, and I'm sorry in advance if I'm bad at the pronunciation, I googled it and that's my attempt. So Strogo is one of the longest pedestrian streets in Europe, and it exemplifies mixed use zoning. The street is aligned with a variety of shops, cafes, restaurants, bars, theaters, churches, and all the while the upper floors above the commercial spaces are often and residential apartments, making it a living urban area and not just commercial, aka mixed use. This type of street design and mixed use zoning erases that island idea from my awful metaphor earlier. Now you don't have to go from island to island to live your life because it's all around you. We need more mixed use spaces in our cities and our suburbs, not just this endless production of single family homes dictated by bad policy. Hot take that might get me roasted in the comments, so uh, oops in advance, but I, I get really frustrated when people complain about the suburbs and give this blanket singular reason of of capitalism is to blame. Because in my opinion, that disguises the real heart of the issue under buzzwords and takes us that much farther away from actions that'll really help us improve the situation. I am sure some people are going to disagree with me, but for me, this zoning problem is a prime example of capitalism not getting to do what it is really good at, meeting consumer demands through creation and innovation. If we didn't have these outdated zoning rules that forced out mixed use spaces, entrepreneurial developers could come in to create denser housing options with shops and businesses mixed in there. It's already happening in some pockets of our suburbs, but not enough to meet demand. Speaking of which, another great video to check out is this one by Vox that's in defense of the gentrification building that some people love to hate on. What's truly crazy to me is that we have this policy-backed supply problem when the government would make a lot more money with denser developments and mixed-use spaces. This video by Strong Towns does a great breakdown of what's referred to as the tax productivity of a space. Here is a fantastic visualization they use to explain. These are real places in Asheville, North Carolina, and you can see that the property taxes per acre generated is very different in these three locations. The big Walmart that is classic suburbs brings in $6,500 an acre, and the single family house brings in a little over $19,000. Meanwhile, the mixed use space used to be vacant for 40 years, but since it's been revived and updated, it now has a tax productivity 
of $634,000 per acre. It blows away the other two locations, thus improving the tax productivity of the entire community. The consulting firm Urban3 does revenue model analyses of cities, and through them you can actually see how much more valuable the denser mixed-use spaces are. This analysis of Ogden, Utah shows how the compact historic areas, which likely aren't subject to the same restrictive zoning of more recent years, produces some of the most potent tax value per acre. Those are the purple beams. Not to mention, the denser and mixed-use areas can save a community money by making more efficient use of existing infrastructure like roads, utilities, public services. If you think about our current sprawling suburbs, you still have to have roads and sewage lines and electric grids for those spread out communities. And those all cost more money the longer and larger they are. And here is where our other boring word comes into play, subsidies. One of the big problems with suburbia right now is that we subsidize a lot of things like roads and utilities for suburbia. The problem with this is it ends up masking the true cost of the suburbs. So those of us who live in the suburbs, we're not really paying as much as it takes to make sure that the suburbs are financially sustainable. Not Just Bikes again has a phenomenal video on this topic titled Suburbia is Subsidized, Here's the Math, and in it he has this great little quiz on who is subsidizing who in Lafayette, Louisiana. So here's a fun quiz. Which of these two neighborhoods is subsidizing the other? Number one or number two? Yeah, it's the first one that's subsidizing the second. The poorest people in Lafayette are consistently subsidizing wealthy suburbanites. Honestly, his whole video is chock full of valuable information, so go check it out after you're done with this video. But I'm gonna nab one more part on subsidies because it's just so good at conveying what the problem is. In Eugene, Urban 3 analyzed nine categories of development residential, mixed use, and commercial in low, medium, and high density. And here's what the average revenue for the city looked like after taking into account the servicing of these properties. In the case of Eugene, the low density suburban housing is being subsidized by everything else. And I'm not saying that low density single family homes should not exist because I genuinely think that they serve a real purpose for some people. Some people want the privacy and the space that the current suburb setup provides. And I get it, they should have it as an option. But if you want that option, you should be paying for it. Right now, our current subsidy setup doesn't let this happen, disincentivizing us from making the changes needed to improve the suburbs. So what's the impact of these suburban problems? Well, some of the problems we already touched on, like the way that the suburbs right now can make people feel more lonely and make communities more economically unproductive. And like I hinted at before, the environmental toll is significant. According to Brookings, quote, in the metropolitan regions, suburbs emit up to four times the household emissions of their suburban cores. Indirectly, I would argue that the suburban culture of more space and even the introduction of things like McMansions make us lean even more into the trends of overconsumption. Think about it, if we have hundreds or thousands more square feet in our homes, that's all extra space to fill up with junk. Furnishing every room, packing every closet with clothes, buying an extra car because we have room for it in our garage. Those are all purchases that weigh on our wallets and our planet. And with more Americans moving to the suburbs every year, and with more people globally projected to live in urban areas in the next few decades, we need to take the redesign of these places seriously. Which brings me to the final piece on this topic, at least for this video. Speaking of which, I think this is going to be my longest video to date, so let me know in the comments below what you think. So last but not least, let's talk about solutions. Specifically, what can we do on an individual level to help move the needle in a better direction for the suburbs? Here are three main pillars of action that you can take, and I'll also link a bunch of resources in the description below if you want to learn more. First thing you can do, just talk about the issues. Talk about them with friends, family, anyone who complains about housing prices or suburban monotony. Because people can't get passionate about the issues and the solutions until they have the language for what the problems even are. Today I want to talk about good urban design in the suburbs and how we can make places like this so much better. I personally had no idea what urban planning was a few years ago until I came across YouTube channels like Not Just Bikes and City Nerd, and then I later went on to read the book Happy City. Those materials woke me up to the possibility that my suburban angst could be addressed, that there were real reasons that I was frustrated with the suburbs, and more importantly, that there were ways to make it better. So keep the conversation going in your own life. And like I mentioned before, I'll link some resources down below, but also if you're someone who has any 
resources or advice or anything like that, feel free to comment it for others so we can all help one another. The second way you can be part of the solution is through voting. Things like zoning and subsidies and pedestrian safe walkways and bike lanes, those are governed by policy. So if you want to see changes made in your community, vote in local elections and see which local candidates support things like mixed use zoning, transit oriented development, green infrastructure, and affordable housing. We often ignore local government because it doesn't get as much press, but local government influences us a ton, especially on matters like improving the suburbs. And finally, if you really want to get involved and go the extra mile, you can lobby locally. This can look like contacting your representatives, attending local town halls, joining a local advocacy group. There's this acronym known as NIMBYs, which is known as Not In My Backyard. These are typically single family homeowners who don't want new developments around their homes, whether it's zoning changes or public transport, despite the fact that they may otherwise support those things. They just, you know, want it anywhere but where they are. And NIMBYs are very good at lobbying locally, which then shoots down a lot of potential positive changes for the suburbs. The opposite is to be a YIMBY, a yes in my backyard. If you're looking to affect change, highly recommend going out there and being a YIMBY. But okay, that was a lot of me talking for today. My mouth is really dry now, my throat is hoarse, uh, but let me know what you guys think of all of this. Oh my god. Let me know what you guys think of all of this. Do you think that the suburbs should change? And if so, how would you like to see it change? Or do you prefer they stay as they are? They're fine as is. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below and what topics you'd like to see me cover next. Thank you so much to my patrons who support my channel on Patreon. If you guys wanna be a patron, you can go and find the link down below. Same goes for those who support on Buy Me A Coffee. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys watching and I will see you next time. Bye.